Our first uh, speaker, uh, outside guest speaker today, is Dr. Francis Collins. Uh, all of you know Dr. Francis Collins as the director of the National Institute of Health. And uh, as you also know, he had the vision to recognize the incredible importance of translational research as part of the portfolio of NIH. Now, when the, as president of American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering, when we heard this wonderful vision, we recognize that translation is the concept that's fundamentally in the uh, breadbasket of medical and biological engineers. That's what we do. We translate discovery to devices for impacting uh, patient care and to drugs for impacting patient care. So we uh, asked to meet with Dr. Collins and his uh, staff to talk about how AMB and NIH might work together to, uh, to uh, uh, catalyze the maximum success of this effort. We had a wonderful meeting, and that was followed soon thereafter with a talk at the annual event of the AMB uh, to all of our fellows, which was absolutely sensational in engaging us and making us understand how bi medical and biological engineering could have such a positive and important impact to the mission of NIH. It's my pleasure to introduce the director of NIH, Dr. Francis Collins. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all of you. It's an absolute delight to be part of this remarkable symposium uh, celebrating the 10th anniversary of NIBIB and all the great science uh, that is coming forward as a consequence of this uh, really innovative and exciting aspect of what NIH is all about. I want to particularly give my thanks uh, to the director, Roderick Pettigrew, who has been such a visionary leader in this area of bioimaging and bioengineering, and I think has uh, through the remarks that he put forward already, giving you just some snapshots of the really remarkable scientific opportunities that this institute supports. It's a very exciting time scientifically, and it's great to have such leadership and a component at NIH that really focuses on this. And our interactions with AIMBE and other organizations only add to our excitement about where this whole field is going. I confess to being a bit of a techie myself, so it is really delightful to have a chance to think a little bit about what I might say to you this morning and pick out a few examples of areas in this space that seem to be particularly groundbreaking, and it's obviously a broad field of opportunity, so I will pick just a few examples, and please forgive me if I left out some of the ones that you might have chosen yourself or that you might have actually thought were even more appropriate. But in my brief remarks, I wanted to both celebrate uh, NIBIB and to uh, point out how this fits together in a broader sense with where NIH is going and where medicine is going. First of all, congratulations uh, on this anniversary. Uh, here's a, uh, a representation of the act that created uh, this particular part of NIH, 24th day of January 2000. And uh, congratulations to all uh, in this room and outside this room who have made this into such an exciting part of NIH. Congratulations uh, to Dr. Pettigrew for having also made it possible for the Senate of the United States uh, to re make a resolution celebrating this achievement. Uh, you can see here that that happened just earlier this week uh, with uh, support from Senators Burr and Mikulski. Uh, but wide recognition, therefore, about what's happening and lots of positive things said about NIH and NIBIB. NIH has a noble mission. It is science in pursuit of fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems. That's our basic science component. And the application of that knowledge to extend healthy life and reduce the burdens of illness and disability. The, that simple sentence sums up what we are all thinking about every day when we come to this remarkable place and have a chance to work uh, with some 19,000 individuals who have their sleeves rolled up <laughs> trying to make this happen. And of course, that's a small proportion of what NIH is all about since most of what we support is research going on out there in our nation's finest institutions and some abroad as well. And for me as the NIH director, it is truly a privilege uh, to be able to stand at the helm of such an exciting operation and try to steer it a little bit here and there. But most of the really important scientific leadership comes from the institute directors of our 27 institutes and centers, and hence uh, the very important role that they play. And again, Dr. Pettigrew plays that role extremely well. I thought I would talk about four T's here. Uh, NIH investments in innovation, I'm talking about the future, and innovation is what we need to focus on to make those things happen. 
So I'm going to talk about technology, about translation, about talent, and well, yes, indeed, because we are at a challenging financial time. How do we also justify this in terms of economics? Because believe me, I get asked that question a lot, including at my house hearing uh, yesterday in front of Energy and Commerce. And I think we have a very good story to tell there as well, and we shouldn't be shy to tell it. So let's talk first about technology, obviously in the sweet spot of NIBIB, uh, with so many things that are coming out of the bioengineering, bioimaging approaches uh, that are leading us towards new ways of diagnosis, prevention, and treatment. I just mentioned one that is now actually beginning to take shape in the basic arena of technology development, teaching us about how exactly the brain is really wired. This is coming out of the NIH Blueprint for Neuroscience Research, a collection of institutes that are all interested in the brain, and has led to the formation of this human connectome project. And part of that has been uh, the support of a diffusion magnetic resonance imaging scanner, uh, which has very high detailed resolution and is faster than conventional scanners. And if you've not seen any of these pictures or movies, I would really encourage you uh, to look at some of the literature, whoops, let me see if I can get that movie to run, uh, which has recently come forward uh, in this effort because it is really quite a remarkable kind of image that one can achieve uh, of this two-dimensional sheets of parallel neuronal fibers that cross paths at right angles, as paper in science that will show you more of this, and teaching us things about uh, how the brain is working in the living individual that we probably would not have imagined we could learn about quite this soon. Lots of relevance uh, for understanding normal and pathological development, and again, very uh, much driven uh, by uh, clever, innovative engineering approaches. In translation, where we take the technology and try to move it forward uh, into clinical applications, uh, that is obviously an area of intense interest across NIH and all of the institutes and centers. One of the new kids on the block is the uh, effort to try to focus this in a way that would enable even more rapid development of therapeutics. And one of the motivations for that is what you see on this graph, which shows you what we have learned over the course of just the last couple of decades about the molecular basis of disease. This comes out of the compendium Mendelian Inheritance in Man, which has been keeping track of what diseases do we actually know the cause of at the molecular level. And you can see we're up to now to about 4,500 conditions, most of them relatively rare, and many of them caused by single gene mutations. But look at the rate at which that has happened, and this is about to go up, I think, even steeply. Uh, again, because of the availability of whole genome or whole exome sequencing that enables you to find the cause of disease even in very small numbers of individuals. The cost of DNA sequencing is a major driver of a lot of this technology. Uh, when we finished that first human genome sequence in 2003, it cost us about $400 million to get that reference copy. And now your genome or mine can be sequenced for about $8,000. So we've dropped the cost by roughly 50,000-fold in the space uh, of less than a decade. And there's no evidence that that particular drop uh, in cost is, has reached any kind of limit. No laws of physics are going to be violated here. We can keep on dropping this down, uh, potentially, uh, to the point where a human genome sequence is down to $100 or even less. And that opens up all kinds of possibilities in terms of medical applications. Certainly also DNA sequencing has found its way uh, into basic science in lots of applications, not only in terms of whole genomes or whole exomes, but just using it to count things like RNA expression, for instance, or epigenomics. It's been quite a revolution, and the people in my lab over in Building 50 actually can't quite imagine how we did anything in human biology before we had the genome sequence and the ability to, to collect this kind of data. That's all the good news. The bad news is if you look at this same diagram and ask how many of those 4,500 conditions where we know the molecular basis actually now have a treatment, it's about 250. So we have this huge gap between what we know and what we can do about it. And that clearly is an opportunity as well as a responsibility and a challenge. And that's one of the motivations uh, for trying to uh, develop a better way to tackle the problem of developing therapeutics. Most of you know how that works, but let me just run you through a little cartoon here. If you have a disease that you are seeking a small molecule therapeutic for, you're faced with the challenge of sifting through the universe of shapes of small molecules to try to find the one that actually has benefit for that disease, that hits the target in just the right way uh, to result in clinical uh, improvement. 
That means you're starting with a very large library of structures uh, here cartooned, uh, and you are trying to pick out using some kind of assay which of those actually has some potential of hitting the target in a beneficial way. And then you have much work to do to sift through that in the preclinical space to come up with something you might actually feel was safe enough uh, to offer to a patient in a phase one trial. The problem is this is a terribly inefficient process with huge losses along the way. You start with maybe 10,000 of those compounds. You sift them down into uh, maybe 250 in the preclinical, and ultimately, perhaps five of these make it into clinical trials. But experience being what it is, right now, only one of those will actually achieve approval by the FDA. Notice the timetable at the bottom, 14 years, uh, the average time that head has taken over the last many decades uh, to get to success. And because of all the failures, which are 99% plus, uh, you are also facing enormous costs because you have to pay for all those failures in order to actually have some successes along the way. So the estimated cost of each success is now in the neighborhood of $2 billion. Well, that's just not sustainable. With those thousands of diseases that are waiting for answers, presumably we have to come up with a better way to approach this. And we need to do so and do something fairly drastic in terms of the scientific approach, because the experience here is truly daunting. This is a paper from Nature Review's Drug Discovery just published a couple months ago. These authors basically tallied up uh, what the cost was in, in terms of uh, drug development since 1950. And using inflationary corrections, they plotted here the number of drugs per $1 billion of R&D spending, and they plotted this out on a log scale, and you can see it looks really troubling here. It almost looks like some sort of law is at work here. And it's a law that's going the wrong direction. Uh, now down to sort of less than one drug per billion dollars. Where back in 1950, goodness, uh, there was more like 30 or 40 on uh, in inflationary corrected dollars of that same thing. So what's going on? The authors, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, decided maybe this needed a name. It sort of looks like a law. So they called it E-Room's Law which, if you notice, is Moore's Law written backwards, <laughs> because this is going backwards. So what's the problem? Well, the engineers in the room would probably say, that's your pipeline? That's the best you can do? What's going on here? Why all the failures? Why the slow progress? Uh, what could you do to choose your targets better to begin with? How could you figure out how to fail early instead of late? Uh, all of those are critical issues. And science has come along in interesting ways in the last few years to enable us to tackle some of those questions in truly innovative fashions instead of continuing uh, to do things the way we have, which clearly from this diagram is not working so well. So this really was the motivation for us here at NIH after much consultation uh, through many different venues, particularly the Scientific Management Review Board and consultations with the private sector through my advisory committee to the director. Uh, we established uh, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences just last December 23rd. And it is not intended at any uh, sense uh, to be the place where all translation happens at NIH, not at all. It's intended to be a hub, a catalyst, to look at actual bottlenecks in this pipeline as themselves scientific and engineering problems, not specifically attached to any disease or any specific small molecule or diagnostic or device project, but looking systematically at the way the whole pipeline works or in many cases does not work. So the NCATS has already gotten itself deeply engaged in a variety of projects, one of which fits, fits rather nicely with one of the examples that Roderick showed you is to try to utilize what we're learning about tissue engineering to be able to do a better job of predicting whether a drug is safe or not before you give it to a patient in a phase one trial. And this has led to an unprecedented collaboration between NIH, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, who are pretty good at wild and crazy engineering ideas, and FDA. And collectively here, we're putting $140 million into this over five years. And the goal is to develop a chip loaded up with as many as 10 different cell types, human cell types, uh, in a fashion that is as much as possible representative of what happens in vivo. So as you saw uh, in the video a few minutes ago about the uh, human liver that was being reimplanted in mouse, in this case, we'd want to have human liver in a three-dimensional organoid on this biochip. 
as well as cells representing heart, kidney, brain, and so on, the places where you most would be interested in seeing a signature of toxicity if that was likely to be a problem. And of course, we need to wire this chip up with a lot of different outputs in order to find out everything we can about what happens to cells when they're exposed to that new test compound. So that probably means looking at gene expression, at metabolomics, at proteomics, and so on. And here is where we hope the science that NIH is pretty good at and the science that DARPA is pretty good at uh, can come together. So there is, uh, between our two agencies now, uh, efforts to put together a consortium and this is to be an interesting cultural experience as well, bringing together staffs of NIH and DARPA to work on this. Uh, awards are anticipated imminently next month, uh, where we hope to put together some of the best ideas about tissue engineering, biology, toxicology, and so on, uh, to create a pathway towards generating such a biochip. Obviously, the goal will be to assemble this in a fashion where you can then test it with compounds where you know the answer. Uh, that they are safe or they're not safe, and then develop the idea about what a signature would look like uh, that would give you confidence that it was reasonable to go ahead with a phase one trial or not reasonable. If this works, presumably it should be much faster and cheaper than the slow, expensive, and not very reliable animal testing, which is the current way in which you have to generate evidence that your compound is safe uh, enough to get a, an IND from FDA. So FDA's involvement here is critical because if this begins to work, we would not want to see this as an add-on, as an additional thing that you have to do to test for safety, but rather as a substitute you know, for the methods that are currently used. And that is an example of the kinds of things that NCATS aims to support. And you've already seen uh, one part of this, the lung on the chip. Uh, I won't go through it again because you already even saw part of this video and saw it much nicer because it had uh, some, some uh, narrative to go with it. I will show you another video quickly. This is one I showed yesterday to the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and it is work supported by NIBIB, the work of John Donahue and others, which is basically then developing this interface uh, between the brain of individuals who have quadriplegia and uh, allowing them through the process of connecting that interface with their own brain function to, uh, to learn how to move a, a robotic arm uh, simply by the thought process uh, that the subject is undergoing. Uh, I must tell you, the members of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee were quite riveted uh, by looking at this. Here is the example uh, where the patient in this case is attempting by her thoughts uh, to pick up this canister, which has coffee in it, and see whether she can bring it to her mouth and take a sip of her own coffee. Uh, all of this being accomplished, as you can see, by the box mounted on the top of her head that allows her thoughts to be translated into that robotic arm. And I think you can see by the smile on the face of the patient and the investigator that this was a pretty good day, <laughs> that this, this really was a remarkable moment. Well, it's great to have all of these capabilities, uh, but we certainly need uh, not only to have great science and great ideas, we need to have the talent of the individuals to pursue that. NIH is intensely interested in encouraging the most innovative ideas to come forward and worried that in the current climate where our budgets are very tight, that peer review sometimes uh, can be a little conservative in terms of not taking as many risks because there's such great solid science in front of them as well. And one of the things we have done in order to try to encourage that kind of innovative approach is a series of special programs, the three you see here, all supported by the Common Fund, that aim at high-risk, high-reward research. The Early Independence Awards, which we've just started, aim to take the most talented graduate students and take them directly from the PhD degree to independence, skipping the postdoc and giving them the chance uh, to show their stuff uh, while they are still in that oftentimes most creative phase and not in a circumstance where they are following other people's guidance but allowed to put their own ideas forward. We just made 10 of those awards in this first year. Uh, the best day I think I had in the last six months was coming to listen to those 10 grantees talk about what they were going to do. A truly remarkable and inspiring uh, group of fearless young investigators who are aiming to do things that were quite bold indeed. The New Innovator Award also aims to try to bring new investigators to NIH who've not previously received grants from us, not requiring nearly as much in the way of preliminary data, but demanding that what they put forward has to be a groundbreaking kind of approach, otherwise they can't be evaluated as part of this program. 
The Transformative R01, and now called the Transformative Research Award because it isn't really quite so much like an R01, also has to be transformative but can support a large teams uh, and has less in the way of budget limits than many of the other kinds of formats uh, that people are used to. And the Pioneer Award, which has now been around for more than five years, which gives an investigator the chance to write a relatively brief proposal with some bold ideas and then to be funded for a five-year period as an investigator and basically allowing them to move in the direction that makes the most sense scientifically, not particularly tied too tightly you know, to original plan, very much like a Howard Hughes position. And those also have turned out to be very much uh, productive parts of our portfolio. As an example, I'll talk about an individual who's actually received a Pioneer Award and more recently a transformative R01 and who is a grantee of NIBIB. And this is Sonny Shi. Uh, this is an investigator at MIT who's a chemist uh, who has actually applied some very innovative approaches to do single molecule visualization in single cells, an area of intense interest. In fact, we're about to start a new common fund uh, effort in single cell biology. Uh, Sonny Shi, uh, using his skills uh, as a chemist, uh, has been able to come up with systems that allowed you uh, to look at expression of single protein molecules. What you're looking at here from a publication in 2006, those yellow dots there are single proteins uh, which are marked by a version of GFP called Venus. And basically this is a circumstance where they've created a transgene in this bacterial system that is only rarely expressed because it's actually repressed by the LAC a repressor, but occasionally one copy of the RNA uh, gets read off anyway. And that one copy then is used to make three or four proteins which you appear, appear as bright dots in that particular bacterium. And that is kind of fun to watch. Here you see the, uh, the uh, solid uh, static version. Uh, we can run a little movie here. Now watch the yellow dots as they begin to appear. They're just sort of firing off there as an RNA was transcribed, and then proteins are briefly made from that RNA in that same cell. That was fun. Let's watch that again. <laughs> see that yellow dot now will pop right up there. You can see, oh, must have made an RNA there. Now maybe four or five copies of the protein being generated from that transcript and teaching us a lot of interesting things. It's obviously nice eye candy, but it's also teaching us a lot about biology. He has gone on uh, with a colleague at MIT, Xiaowei Zhuang, uh, who's been also a very creative individual in terms of figuring out how to see things at a resolution that you thought you couldn't do with light microscopy using this technique called STORM. And here is just one image uh, here again of an E. coli system uh, looking at a nucleoid-associated protein <coughs> called HNS. This is what this would look like in phase contrast. Fluorescence of a conventional sort would look like that. Look at the level of resolution uh, showing where that protein is in these individual bacterial cells. So lots of exciting technology being supported through uh, these grant mechanisms, the Pioneer Awards uh, and the transformative R01s. I wanted also to mention something that NIBIB is doing, which I think is uh, kind of exciting, bringing young scientists uh, at undergraduate level uh, into the realm of uh, competing with each other uh, for this debut challenge. And uh, this is basically NIBIB's uh, opportunity uh, for people to compete for prizes. Uh, the deadline for receipt of the uh, applications was June 2nd, so uh, presumably there will be some announcements before too long. Uh, diagnostic devices is one, uh, one approach, therapeutic another, or technology to aid underserved populations in low income cir circumstances or individuals with disabilities. Uh, so very much uh, an innovative way to try to drum up excitement uh, in undergraduates. They have to be uh, submitted as teams, and as you can see, there is money involved, uh, which tends to get the attention of undergraduates. Finally, there is this issue about how we need in the current climate to be sure that we're making our case for the value of what biomedical research is doing, not only for the future of human health, but for the economy. And again, I think as all of us are, are called upon uh, to defend the investment of taxpayer dollars in this activity, we should be prepared to say why this is a good investment. We need to make that case because we are not at the present time enjoying a particularly favorable environment for the support uh, of biomedical research through NIH. You can see here in this series of bars, the purple bars tell you what the appropriations have been to NIH over the course of the last 13 
or 15 years. You can see the doubling that happened between 98 and 2003, which was a wonderful opportunity uh, for growth and for new investigators to come into the field. But you can also see that we flattened off pretty badly after that. And if you look at the yellow bars, which take account of inflation, we are actually losing ground and have been since 2003. Our purchasing power now is down by about 20% over what we could do nine years ago. And obviously with the current focus, on, and appropriately so, on our difficult financial circumstance and deficits, there is certainly no indication that this is going to get any better, and presumably it could even get a lot worse, especially if those sequesters that are being talked about happen to kick in on January 2nd of next year. If that were to happen, we would in one fell swoop lose $2.4 billion of the NIH budget uh, we would have to cut back our grant awards uh, for FY13 to uh, unprecedented low levels. About 2,300 grants that we wanted to give would not be given. So there is a cloud on the horizon, and we need to be defending this, as I tried to do yesterday in the hearing, but as all of us, I think, are called upon to do from time to time, why this is such an important investment for our economy, for American competitiveness, but for human health is our number one approach. If you're looking for evidence uh, to cite about that, there are a number of really remarkable analyses that have been done by credible economists uh, that make this case. That every dollar that NIH gives out in a grant results in more than twofold return on investment in the first year in economic goods and services to the local community. Our grants support about 432,000 jobs, high quality jobs. And the spin-offs from what NIH does uh, probably results in multiplying that number by a factor of 20 in terms of employment through pharmaceutical and biotech companies. And we are a major driver, therefore, of the American economy, and cutbacks at NIH will have ripples that will be really quite severe. Again, there's lots of information about this. If you go to our homepage, NIH, and look for the button that says Impact, you can see a long list of documents that go into this issue about economics and the evidence that supports uh, the value of what we do. And I think this is a particularly moment then as we are facing this uh, potential challenge uh, to the future of our enterprise uh, to emphasize that return and to do so in a fashion where it's clear we're all speaking together. It's one thing to have somebody stand up with one voice and talk about the value of, of medical research. It's even better if that's a part of a symphony with a chorus and we all kind of have the same song sheets in front of us basically arguing what we are about is a noble mission to try to improve human health. We have a remarkable track record in terms of what's happened in the last few decades with, for instance, heart attacks and strokes have been reduced as a cause of death by more than 70% in the last 40 years. HIV AIDS no longer being a death sentence but consistent with lifespan uh, to age 70 and beyond. Uh, and a variety of other really remarkable achievements. And we shouldn't be shy uh, to sing that song uh, to people who are interested in asking the question about whether this particular part of government investment is worth the dollars. It is more than that. As far as where you're going in terms of this symposium and the future of NIBIB and the rest of the uh, NIH and all the disciplines that we represent, I have a hard time imagining that very clearly, and I'm fond of this quotation from the guy who wrote The Little Prince, Le Petit Prince, if you read it in French, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, who says, as for the future, your task is not to foresee it, because that's too hard, but to enable it. Of all the parts of NIH that I think is really focused on that remarkable task and opportunity of enabling, it seems to me NIBIB is right in the thick of that. I congratulate all of you for the progress you've made, and I wish you another wonderful decade to come. Thank you very much. You know, I think at this point, it's still the health argument that gets people's initial interest because everybody has concerns about themselves, their loved ones, their constituents in terms of health issues that need more attention. But as soon as you get that part of it, oftentimes their then response is, well, yeah, but can't the private sector do this better? Or why are we giving you so much money? Couldn't you do this for a lot less? Then I think you have to be prepared to come right, right behind that uh, with the economic argument, which is a very compelling one as well. Where is most of the cost? If the cost is in the final testing of those five targets, then the total reduction in cost is 
No, you're, you're quite right. The major source uh, of cost uh, uh, that doesn't get us anywhere is in failures uh, in phase two and phase three. Because by that time, you've invested tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in a compound. And the major cause of failure is efficacy. Uh, the compound turns out to be safe, but it doesn't work. So another effort, and I didn't have time to go into this, which we're deeply engaged in right now with industry as major partners, is how to do a better job of target validation. Right at the front end uh, of this development, how do you pick the right targets so that you don't go down this path very far and ultimately discover you've got a drug that just doesn't work? There are some exciting potentials there. Again, because of the ability to use tools like genomics, uh, we have the chance uh, to do target validation in humans instead of perhaps in cell culture or in animal models in ways that we couldn't have before. Uh, we have a human knockout project that's underway right now. Uh, nature's been at that project for all of human history, and now we have a chance uh, with things like exome sequencing to detect the consequences of that. Take an example like this gene called PCSK9, which uh, Helen Hobbs and colleagues uh, in Texas discovered carries knockout mutations in about 2% of people. And those people have very low levels of LDL cholesterol and very low risks of cardiovascular disease. She even found a few homozygotes who have no functional PCSK9 at all. They're entirely well. Their cholesterol levels are like 12. Uh, and their risk of heart disease seems to be extremely low. Now, talk about a great way to validate a target. That tells you that if you built a drug that's an antagonist to PCSK9, and you actually hit the target, you should provide substantial clinical benefit with a reliable biomarker, and it should not be toxic, because the people who don't have this for life seem to be just fine. That was a great example, but could we do this more systematically? by identifying such loss of function, human knockouts, uh, for lots of other genes, and focus on the ones like PCSK9 where the loss of function actually seems to provide some advantage. Those would be perfect targets then to mount a campaign to build a small molecule against that target. That's kind of the thought process that we're going through right now with industry as our close partners, because they need this too. They're aware that the way in which targets have been chosen has resulted in a great deal of failure, oftentimes very late in the process. One more quick question. Yeah, quick, uh, Dr. Collins, in terms of the dollar amount, or so the time uh, being taken for drug development, shouldn't we include a general statement uh, that, apart from uh, trying to be more sophisticated, uh, the problems remaining are much harder to solve? Uh, therefore, it is taking much larger effort, both in money and time, uh, to achieve the goal. That's certainly part of it. And people would argue that the low-hanging fruit in terms of developing drugs has already been plucked, and that the targets that we now need to go after are going to be tougher, uh, less well understood, perhaps less easy to hit uh, with our particular small molecule or biologic approach. That's certainly in there. That's part of Eroom's law, undoubtedly. But it's not the whole story. And if we have a chance to stop that downward curve or even start it back up again with new science, facing the fact that we may have more difficult science in terms of the targets themselves, uh, we should put lots of energy into that. Uh, the future really depends on that. I very much oversimplified all the factors that go into this, but I do think we have an opportunity here if we work together to try to do something uh, fairly interesting. One other thing we just announced, which is a way to shortcut all of this, which I'm pretty excited about, is to take those compounds that got all the way to phase two or phase three, but failed to show efficacy, but were shown, out, uh, shown at that point to be safe, and figure out, okay, so it didn't work for diabetes. Might this drug have worked for schizophrenia or cancer? We're seeing lots of examples where that kind of repurposing actually works out pretty well, uh, whether it's thalidomide for myeloma or whether it's, goodness, AZT for HIV AIDS. ACT wasn't developed for that. It was developed for cancer. There are now eight companies that have agreed to open their freezers and make 58 compounds available for investigators in academia or in small businesses to look for new uses. And if that turns out uh, to look promising, one could go almost straight to a phase two trial with compounds where a lot of that investment's already been made. That won't work for everything, but if it works for a few, it's well worth the effort. Thank you very much. Thank you all.